There we go. There we go. Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday evening to you and um, happy rainy evening as well. I don't know if it's uh, starting to come down by you, but we see some little splashes and pitter patters out there. So I'm hopeful that we'll get some of that much needed rain uh, that we keep being promised, but then it seems to go away. Uh, anyway, we have all kinds of cool things that people have shared uh, over this past week. So uh, we're going to get going with our slideshow. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use that comment feature and then I will address them. Sound like a plan? All right. Let's get going here. There we go. So uh, last week's column uh, focused on a species that I still think of as the new guy around here, uh, at least in, um, in St. Charles, the barred owl. Um, and Susan Burton, you know, when I started um, volunteering for the Forest Preserve District back uh, over 20 years ago now, there was talk of barred owls and they were certainly present in Illinois, but to see one in Kane County was, was pretty unusual. And um, now not only am I uh, hearing about other people seeing them in Kane County, but I finally got to see one in Kane County too. Uh, this was up at uh, Tekawitha Woods a, a couple of weeks ago. And I have to thank um, my little dog, Boker. Some of you might know him as tech support puppy. He's not with us uh, again tonight, um, but it, he's still with us. He's just not you know, here in the office, but he's, um, he had stopped to sniff something. So I was looking around and what should I find staring back at me from the woods next to the Fox River Trail at uh, up at Tekwitha, but, and uh, I, I tell you, this is an owl that really is, uh, when, when, we, when we talk about owls, there's always this sort of mystique that surrounds them because so often they're active when humans are not or when our uh, eyes aren't working as well because there's low light uh, levels of light. But, but take a look at this bird. Uh, look at those dark eyes. Uh, this is um, a bird, it's in the genus Strix. Uh, these birds do not have uh, the feather tufts on top of the head like we see with uh, the, the great horned and uh, the eastern screech owl, which are our other two uh, year-round species here in Kane County. But uh, it's just, I, I think, sort of a haunting bird. And then the way it, um, it flies, it, it has that very uh, owl, uh, famous owl characteristic of, of being able to fly without making any sound. So uh, when the, the bird attacked with them, when it decided it had enough of Boker and I, uh, it just kind of dropped off the branch and flew away, didn't make a sound. Which is not to say that barred owls are silent. These are some of the most vocal owls around. Um, whether you've heard them here um, in King County or if you've heard them in other parts of, of Illinois or uh, across the country, uh, when there's barred owls around, chances are you will sooner or later become aware of them. Now, their uh, their typical call is the uh, fits the pattern of words. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Uh, I'm gonna play it, and then maybe we can all practice it because um, it's it's kind of fun. <laughs> You know, it's, it's fun to do in the car um, if you're by yourself. <laughs> Maybe be not so fun if you're with others, but uh, it is a really fun call and it's very distinctive. It's quite different from the great horned owl. They have more of a, uh, you know, I'm not even gonna do that because I didn't practice it ahead of time, but they have a, a different pattern. Um, I've heard it as uh, who's up late, me too. Something like that. Uh, and then we have the screech owl that has uh, the whinny call. Um, just they also have a, a 
have been connected with a lot of folklore over the years because of the ghost-like qualities of the screech owl call. But uh, anyway, barred owls, besides that, that uh, very distinctive who cooks for you call, they make a lot of other sounds too. Uh, check this one out. It's sort of a variation on who cooks for you, but there was some some wailing and some uh, uh, hooting. Uh, in fact, this is sometimes referred to as a hoot owl. Oh, that's kind of a generic term. A lot of people just call owls hoot owls because owls hoot. But um, this is a very, very vocal species, even though it makes no sound when it flies. Now, uh, here's some pictures from um, a resident here in St. Charles Township. Uh, Sue sent these in uh, from, uh, these were, these photos were taken in the backyard. This was a bird that was perched uh, on the bird feeder. Uh, it saw something of its liking and she said, sure enough, it landed a short distance away on a, uh, a ground squirrel. So these are helpful birds to have around. Uh, they can uh, help keep rodent populations down, uh, but their diet isn't by any means confined to rodents. They're um, often found actually near water and have a fondness for uh, frogs and sometimes even things like uh, crayfish, uh, other things that dwell uh, near water. So, so they have um, a fairly varied diet. Um, they're just really interesting to watch. This was another video that was sent in. Uh, a gentleman named Greg said that he was up, he was bow hunting last fall and he was in his tree stand, which from what I've heard, a tree stand is just a really cool way to observe wildlife. Even if you're not hunting, uh, you get a unique perspective because you're up several feet in the air. Well, he said, you know, as he was uh, sitting up in his tree stand, he was kind of surprised to see this character staring. And I think the, the owl was sort of thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be hunting in these woods. What are you doing hunting in these woods? Uh, so they just kind of had a nice few little moments. Uh, you'll notice how the owl is moving its head. Oh, he's about to take off. Again, that silent flight. Um, but see how it moves its head from side to side? That's a very uh, owl, or actually a bird of prey thing to do. Uh, owls and, and hawks too, they, they can't move their eyes in their eye sockets. You know, if you wanna give somebody a, a sidelong glance, you can do that without turning your head. But owls eyes are, are fixed in their skulls. So when they wanna get a different perspective, they, they can't move their eyeballs, they have to move their whole head. So uh, you'll often see birds of uh, prey, uh, owls specifically, Do, whether it's um, maybe a prey animal or, um, in this case, a guy in a tree stand. <laughs> Here's a couple more photos that Greg sent um, showing the owl, checking them out from uh, different perspectives. Uh, the owl was fine. Uh, Greg was fine. Uh, they all lived happily ever after. But this is an owl that, that we're hearing more about uh, in eastern Kane County. Uh, it seems to be doing fairly well in the area. I've heard from several people who have owls. Uh, they've heard them and in some cases seen them in their neighborhoods. Barred owls do tend to be a little bit more nocturnal than say uh, a great horned owl, but um, and the nighttime for them to make them. They can make that noise pretty much anytime they feel like it. Now, um, there's another side to the, the story of the barn owl, and it concerns their range. Now, historically, this was a bird of the eastern forests, but if we think back uh, historically about what happened in the east as um, European settlers uh, came to the New World, they needed lumber, uh, they needed spaces to grow in the eastern forest started to disappear. Now, the barred owl um, was a habit of uh, inhabitant of those uh, forests there. And so as the habitat started to disappear, um, the owls had to, you know, 
they had some decisions to make, but not quite simultaneously, but shortly after um, the, uh, those changes were occurring in the Eastern forest, uh, settlers started to move westward. And with them uh, went the tree. Uh-oh, 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 there we go. Going the wrong way there for a second. So as they moved to areas uh, that didn't have trees, um, they planted them. And that created a means for the barred owl to make its way uh, across the country. Um, so it's, it's territory, it's a range actually started to spread in the late 1800s. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, pretty neat studies online um, looking at literature reviews of the barred owl that talk about how in the late 1870s it was spotted for the very first time in uh, central North Dakota um, and also up in uh, east central Montana. Uh, if any of you are interested in uh, those studies, they, um, uh, the literature reviews, they I would be glad to send you the links for them. They were in the uh, Midwest Naturalist um, magazine a few years back, but it was really kind of cool um, to read about how these animals uh, were able to take advantage of changes that humans brought on, that um, their range sort of marched across the country. Once they got up towards the uh, Canadian border, um, they actually sort of split and some went to the east and some went to the west. Uh, some went north, some went south. Um, and in the, uh, into the Pacific Northwest, into Washington and Oregon, and then also down into California. Um, there is another uh, population of uh, barred owls in, uh, say, Utah, south into Mexico, but um, we're not going to talk about those right now because the what's going on in the Pacific Northwest with the um, the barred owl was something that that. Came Can we let her know? Can we let her know we lost her? Just 
question here. I think I heard someone. I heard some wings. Thank you for the left. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, and I don't know where I left off. Apparently I was <laughs> going along chatting, uh, having a good old meeting, but I was all alone. I'm so sorry for that. I'm going to try and estimate there. Does anybody know exactly where we left off? Um, uh, I'm going to go back to where I left off. And um, no, no, we didn't see that. Okay, let's, yeah. let's go back. You had the map of the United States showing us the trees. Oh, good. Okay. So yeah, uh, good. Right here. Thank yeah. You. All right. So we'll we'll and I don't know what happened, but I will if I'm. I'm gonna make sure I don't move around and kick something because I don't I don't know what I did. But anyway, so um, we were talking about the history of the the barred owl. Um, its historic range was primarily in the forest of the eastern United States. Uh, those forests were, were pretty thick, uh, but as settlers started to move in, they needed that lumber to build houses and they needed that land to grow crops. So uh, little by little, those trees started to go away. And uh, as that happened, the barred owl uh, started having its first uh, serious threat to, uh, to its range but it didn't last for too long because as those settlers started to fill in along um, the, the East Coast, uh, they then started their movement westward and with them uh, came trees. So trees started appearing in places where we didn't used to have them. And um, when you think about uh, this all happening, basically since say the 18, you know, early, eight, early to mid 1800s is when that Western expansion uh, started, um, it didn't take too long for settlers to move to the west and plant trees along the way and then have the barred owl follow the path that was made by those trees and show up in places like central North Dakota and also in uh, east central Montana. This was in 1873. These birds were seen in an area that they had never been seen before. Uh, and from there, the, uh, the barred owls expansion continued. They went north uh, into Canada and they went to the east and they went to the west and they went to the south. Um, the barred owl expansion proceeded fairly rapidly. Uh, there's a, a fascinating account of this uh, online. Um, if any of you are interested in reading more about uh, the barred owls, um, 
expansion, its range expansion over the last uh, 150 years or so, drop me an email or shoot at me a, a note in the comments and I'll, I'll send you the links to the two articles that I was reading uh, in the, uh, I believe it was, was it Midwest Naturalist uh, or Northwest Naturalist magazines. Uh, a, uh, a researcher whose last name is, uh, I'm gonna say Livesey, L-I-V-E-S, uh, L-I-V-E-Z-E-Y, I believe is the pronunciation on that. Um, I could gladly send you those uh, those links so you can check out the article too. But uh, this uh, the, the changes that, that uh, humans brought on the land actually um, enabled this bird to make some pretty big changes of its own. Um, and that's all well and good for the barred owl. Uh, this is uh, how um, the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology depicts the barred owl's range today. Pay particular attention to that northwest part because as the bird moved northwest, uh, it encountered another species. Um, I guess I put this in there, I forgot the, you know, the uh, barred owl is most certainly um, a bird of wooded habitats, bottomland forests and swamps. In fact, it has kind of a preference for, for habitats that have access to water, uh, bottomland forests, lowlands. Um, they, they will adapt though, as we'll see, uh, they are a habitat generalist, but uh, prairie regions, the Great Plains, until the trees were there, there was no habitat for them and there were no barred owls there. Um, but as it moved to the Northwest and encountered this character here, this is the spotted owl. And that name might ring some bells. Um, it's an, uh, a bird that uh, made a lot of headlines starting back, I would say in the 1970s was when the, uh, the first um, uh, headlines covering the clashes that were occurring between um, loggers in the Pacific Northwest and uh, people who wish to protect the habitat of the spotted owl. Uh, we currently have three subspecies um, in North America. Two of them are uh, listed as threatened, uh, federally listed, uh, because these guys, unlike the barred owl, who's a habitat generalist, these are habitat specialists, and they don't just like, but they, they require old growth multi-story habitat in order to be able to survive uh, and reproduce. Um, this is a, an image from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife showing some uh, barred owl habitat. But um, again, as, as the uh, lumber companies started buying up more and more land and going after that old growth wood, which is really prime uh, lumber, it's got very, uh, the growth rings tend to be narrow. It's a very uh, hard wood, very solid wood, uh, very, um, coveted sort of wood. Um, well, that didn't bode so well for uh, the spotted owl. And as the numbers started to decline uh, fairly precipitously, um, there were actions being taken to, to slow down um, the, the falling, uh, felling of these trees. Well, logging community and the conservation community clashed. Um, there were even jokes like this that were put together. The spotted owl helper, just add spotted owl, comes with macaroni and fleas sauce. And it, uh, by the way, is um, made for laughs, not for consumption. But uh, anyway, it was a little poke at um, how the government and the conservation community seem to be putting the needs of a small and quiet owl before the needs of um, human beings who um, had their livelihood uh, taken from uh, the, uh, were, were having their livelihood taken away from them by the, the putting the brakes on uh, this uh, cutting of the old growth. Um, now, when, when we compare the birds side by side, uh, you can see just how similar they, they are the same uh, genus, just different species. Um, Strix feria is our barred owl. Strix uh, oxygen palace is our spotted owl. Um, a generalist versus a specialist, larger versus smaller, a little more aggressive uh, in its range expansion, uh, less aggressive in the case of the spotted owl. Um, barred owls, when all their needs are being met and their needs are, are 
can be met fairly broadly, they tend to breed annually. Whereas uh, spotted owls, because they're a little bit more particular about things, they might not breed every year. So we've got um, faster reproduction combined with slower reproduction. Um, we've also had instances of the two uh, species interbreeding, uh, creating what some people call sparred owls. So um, there's quite a bit of talk going on about what to do about the barred owl. It is a, a North American native. It, it has expanded its range, but its range expansion has come largely because of human activity. Uh, there is some, um, in some areas, uh, lethal control methods have been employed. Uh, people were actually, um, not just anybody, but uh, um, wildlife biologists were actually going out and shooting barred owls in some areas in, in Washington um, to try and control the spread of the barred owl. But it's, it's an interesting species. Um, it's it's um, success is certainly intertwined with um, the success of humans as we've moved ourselves westward as a European settlement spread. Um, this bird basically went right along with it. Now, um, in uh, our area, um, the barred owl shares habitat with the great horned owl and the eastern screech owl. Um, the great horned owl is quite a bit larger than the barred owl. So um, if there's going to be conflicts, it's usually going to be the barred owl um, yeah, that's not going to win. I don't know about conflicts between barred owls and uh, screech owls. If there's, um, I, I, the screech owl is much smaller than the barred owl. So I would think if they were say competing for um, nesting areas or um, some sort of habitat that they were sharing, I would think that the screech owl would come out on the, uh, the lower end of that deal. But um, right now, all three species seem to be um, doing pretty well here in Kane County. We'll keep an eye though, though, see how, because um, again, the barred owl has not been here um, all that terribly long in the, in the big scheme of things, but we'll, we'll see how things shake out between the great horned owl, the barred owl, and the screech owl. Now, let's move on to another bird. Um, they, uh, a gentleman named Ed sent in some footage that he uh, took of a bird that uh, he and his family discovered over at uh, Dick Young, also known as Nelson Lake Marsh in uh, Batavia. Um, this is a bird that is really interesting. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with great blue herons, really the tall wading birds. Um, well, this is um, a green heron. And Ed's family, as they were observing this bird, they noticed that, uh, they weren't exactly sure what it was, but they noticed that it moved like a heron. And um, looking at, through field guides and things like that, they were able to take a guess, and a correct guess it was that they are, uh, were looking at a green heron. Um, they typically will hunt in uh, shallow water. Let's watch here, as this bird kind of um, prowls the, uh, the shallows over at uh, um, Dick Young. This, I wonder if this might have been one of the pools over there that used to be one of the, I think this is where they used to do the peat mining over there. There's the uh, nice uh, duckweed forming there, the algae on the uh, top of the water. Um, this bird was clearly looking for something. In fact, Ed said it did catch a small maybe fish possibly a small tadpole. Um, they're occasional tool users. They will drop uh, a leaf or a twig on the surface to kind of um, see if any fish come up to inspect it. Um, and they can also swim. If they actually, they, they, they tend to wade, but if they um, go into deeper water, um, they can swim and they can do that because they have a partial webbing. Uh, it's between their outer and middle uh, front toes. And uh, that helps push them through the water. It probably also helps keep them from sinking if they're uh, stepping in some really, really soft substrate, maybe some soft silt in the shallows. But it's a, it's a handy feature that we um, you don't see on, on all the wading birds, but it's an advantage that green herons have. Um, 
so this is uh, what Ed's uh, observations were, that the, the hunting style uh, was very interesting. The head would move slowly from side to side. It would take uh, very few steps um, and it caused very little disturbance on the surface. That's um, key when you're stalking fish in the shallows like this. Um, it, uh, bird like this uses a stealth tactic. Um, there are some other members of the heron family that are the opposite. Um, if you ever go down to Florida, I want to say it's the red heron. You birders can probably help me out with this. I'm, I'm thinking red heron or tricolored heron. It was one of the smaller heron species in between the great blue heron and the green heron, but they, they splash, 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 and they move um, fish um, into the shallows where they can easily grab them. So. Um, an opposite approach, something to look for if you travel down to the southeast. But um, green herons are the kind of bird, if you are out uh, in your near water around here, quiet water typically. Um, one of my favorite places to watch green herons here in St. Charles used to be over at uh, Delnor Woods, but now we've got an aerator in the front pond there. Uh, we do have two other ponds in the park where the, the herons might have moved to. Uh, the aerator though, it, it causes a lot of disturbance and um, it's not quite as uh, favorable of conditions for the, the green heron as there used to be. I've also seen them up at uh, Fearson Creek Park in St. Charles, not on the creek side, but on the um, kind of the, the backwater side, uh, the south end of the peninsula at uh, Fearson Creek Park. So I mean, quiet water, shallow water, um, that's a great place. Those are um, the habitat characteristics, the, the places that you wanna look for uh, if you're gonna go out uh, and try and spot some green herons. Um, so here's some other pictures uh, showing the varied diet of the green heron. It's not just fish, but uh, it could be crayfish, uh, it could be frogs. Um, here's a youngster uh, dining on a dragonfly over here on the right. So um, again, that, that aquatic habitat, um, if it moves and it looks like it's within range, um, these birds are gonna uh, give it a try trying to, to grab it. Um, there's another little uh, trait that isn't always obvious, but these birds do have a crest and um, it will raise, uh, sometimes it's a, a form of excitement um, or it's uh, showing some sort of agitation. But uh, if you ever are looking at what you think is a, a green heron and you're not exactly positive because it's got a crest on it, keep that in mind, it's possible, they do have one. So now we're gonna uh, take a little road trip. Uh, we're gonna go south just um, over the, the county border from Kane into Kendall County. And we're going to go to a forest preserve called Richard Young. It's not Dick Young, uh, which uh, we have here in Kane County, but um, it's a different preserve, it's a different county, but it still has lots of cool stuff. In fact, this was a, a photo I took. Look at that sky. This was one of those uh, really uh, crisp, well, actually it wasn't crisp. It was quite, quite warm out, but the sky had the, a quality that we don't often see in this area. We usually have some haze to our sky, but the, the blue was just so intense that day. These nice puffy clouds. Miss Bonnie, I know you were with me when we uh, explored this wonderful preserve. Um, you might recognize this plant here. Uh, I took the picture because I felt kind of bad for it. This is a a young uh, shagbark hickory tree. And when, they, uh, when the leaf buds on these trees open, they look so neat, uh, except for when there's not enough moisture. Um, these buds looked a little bit sad, a little bit droopy. Again, hopefully the rain that we're getting now uh, is gonna perk things up again, but it was still a, a neat sight um, to see that we've got uh, shagbark hickory regeneration happening. Uh, right out in the front area of the preserve. Now, just to give you an idea of where we're talking, um, this is a, a Google map, and I don't know why part of the county was in darkness uh, when this uh, satellite photo was taken, but um, so here's Route 71. Uh, what I tend to do is, is head down um, on Orchard Road and uh, then Orchard hits 71, just south, right after you cross over the bridge over the Fox River. 
and uh, then you head kind of a south southwest direction. Um, you'll cross Van Emmon Road, and then uh, the entrance to Dick Young is in uh, right here amidst all of these trees. Um, it adjoins Lion Forest Preserve. A uh, Lion Forest Preserve is a kind of a historic farm component to it. Together, the two uh, preserves make up, I think it's around 175 acres. So uh, it's pretty neat and it's it's not too far away and there's all kinds of cool stuff to see. Uh, we were there on a um, nice warm spring day. Uh, there was a nice teaching moment um, on this tree here. If we look uh, growing on the left-hand side, we've got some Virginia creeper, and on the right-hand side, we've got leaves of three, let it be, some poison ivy. So uh, that was certainly worth uh, taking in, although not too closely. Um, and then uh, we came to some stairs. And at the bottom of the stairs, um, so I think I turned the audio down on this. I, well, I'm going to turn the audio down on it because we kept talking about the group that we were with, just we kept talking about what uh, a remarkable, almost like a little fairyland that we come upon. Look at this skunk cabbage. It's uh, skunk cabbage is uh, an indication that you're in a, a fen like uh, habitat. And um, there's lots and lots and lots of skunk cabbage down in the bottom land there at, um, at Richard Young. It just kept going, it was so cool. And this, by the way, this is um, what happens after our earliest blooming wildflower has a chance to shoot its uh, flowers out. Um, if you uh, by chance rub up against some of these leaves or if you take a, a small piece and crush it in your hand, you'll be reminded of why it's called skunk cabbage. It's got quite, a, quite an odor to it. Um, and then, we were uh, lucky enough to stumble upon a small grove of pawpaws. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this plant now because I do tend to uh, plan to write about them for uh, next week's column. But um, pawpaws are not at all common in Kane County. Uh, there's pockets of them in Kendall County. They were in bloom the week we were there, which was, uh, I guess, about uh, not quite two weeks ago that they were blooming. So those blooms might still be hanging in there. It's kind of a cool looking flower though. It, it almost looks like a, a larger version. Although these, I did enlarge these photos. The, the uh, bloom itself wasn't more than maybe an inch and a half across, but um, it's got three inner petals and three outer petals and three sepals. So in that way, it kind of reminded me of a, a trillium. Um, but then the, the color of it and the, um, non-floral scent. It's got kind of a, actually kind of an icky smell to it. Um, it made me think that it, um, it probably isn't trying to attract um, it, your typical pollinators, um, your, your bees. I, I sort of wonder if maybe this has a connection with uh, say beetles or flies, um, but it's, it's a neat plant. Uh, there were several of these um, plants growing there um, just a little bit past the skunk cabbage at Richard Young. Now, um, the last time I saw pawpaws was not in Illinois at all, but this gives you a, a sense of what those plants will grow into. This, I took this down in uh, Lexington, Kentucky at the Arboretum at the, uh, the university there. But they, they do grow a, a large fruit. Um, you know, you pick up pawpaws and you put them in your pocket. You need some pretty big pockets to pick these up. Um, this is a, a, a fruit that was Probably um, I could hold one in my hand that gives you a, a sense of, of the size. Uh, there's some large seeds on the inside and the fruit itself, it, it kind of reminded me of like mushy banana. Um, it's it's a, a plant that maybe as um, things tend to warm up around here as they continue to warm up, uh, we're seeing our temperatures uh, changing, uh, warming in this area over time, uh, it could be that pawpaws will become more common here. But like I said, I'm not gonna say a whole bunch more about that because I do plan to write about them and then we'll talk about them uh, a lot. <laughs> so um, in driving around uh, these last uh, couple of weeks, I've been seeing a lot of um, 
development, I should say, uh, plant development along the sides of our roadways. And I don't know how I feel about it. It's, I know um, I've had people tell me, oh, isn't it great? Look at, look at how beautiful um, our, uh, the sides of our, our country roads are looking these days. Everything is in bloom. Well, the only problem is um, these things aren't native and they are kind of forming monocultures along our country roads. Um, the first one, and, and this is popping up just all over, um, Dame's Rocket, um, it is uh, a member of the uh, Brassica family, which is also the mustard family. It's a prolific cedar. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at it, they go, oh, it's phlox. But look really closely at uh, those uh, petals. Our, our native phlox, uh, which do admittedly have a, a similar type of bloom, uh, but they have five petals. Um, the four petaled flower is a characteristic of our mustard family friends. And I think our most famous mustard family nemesis around here is garlic mustard. Well, check this out. Here's a garlic mustard bloom. And here's the garlic mustard seed pod. Well, here's our Dame's Rocket Bloom, and here's our Dame's Rocket Seed Pod. So uh, very prolific uh, producers of seeds, so that certainly aids the plant in its spread. And something about this year, maybe it's the lack of rain that has caused this plant to, to be so successful. You know, some plants need a lot of water, some plants need a little water. Um, in this case, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, maybe the, the dryness that we're seeing is actually um, helping these plants succeed. Um, that other plant that I mentioned, the wild chervil, um, actually, let's go back. I think this is a video. Yeah. Um, I saw this the other day when I was up, um, this was off of Dunham Road, and I actually pulled the car over to uh, just, there was a literal wall of wild chervil going down Dunham. Um, Traffic was a little heavy, so I um, the video that I made when I was standing in the road, um, I, I, <laughs> it didn't turn out too well. But um, you know, imagine this thickness of plants just in both sides of the highway. Um, it's it's stunning, but it's also startling because uh, wild chervil is also a plant that um, we don't. Uh, I want to see a lot of it's it is not a member of the mustard family it's a member of the carrot family but um, just as we see with our queen anne's lace we get these humble flowers what's a flower's job to do it's to produce seeds um, and uh, that they do so all of those little flowers are going to turn into a whole bunch of little um, little seeds kind of like what you see when you when you plant carrot seeds and um, this plant is continuing to spread. Um, so keep that in mind. It is pretty to look at, but you know, which would you rather have a, a monoculture of maybe one or two plants or um, a diversity of species um, as you drive along our country roads? Now, since we're talking about things that are invading, you know, we talked about butterweed and it is considered native to Illinois, but it's also considered weedy. Well, today, um, actually just this afternoon, I was coming back from doing a program in South Elgin and this brilliant yellow caught my eye uh, as I was coming down McLean Boulevard. So I, I stopped, um, actually paid a visit to uh, one of our fairly new forest preserves, McLean Fen Forest Preserve. Um, just off of McLean Boulevard, a little bit north of Stearns Road. Well, um, part of that forest preserve is a fallow um, field. It looks like it was most recently planted in corn. And um, look, it's, it's, it is a, a startlingly pretty yellow plant, but it just went on and on and on. And this isn't even what I saw from the road. There were other fields farther north that uh, showed um, this one. It was just starting to sprinkle a little bit as I was taking this video. But um, yeah, butterweed is definitely here. I think it's here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, seems quite comfortable here at uh, McLean Fen Forest Preserve. Now, McLean, Clem, uh, McLean Fen 
It is a cool place. I want to spend some more time there. I might do a little segment on that uh, once I get back up there again. There is an actual fen there. Uh, today it was just uh, trickling water. Uh, it's got an interesting history. That fen was almost destroyed uh, when a, a um, series of uh, train cars derailed there. And when they were um, cleaning up that mess, moving, the cars were loaded with soybeans. And as they moved the cars out of the way, they plopped them right on this delicate fen habitat. Um, but uh, the Forest Preserve has uh, control of the land now. Um, there's lots of signs of um, hope, I guess you'd, you'd call it. There's um, um, little compass plants that are coming up right along the trail. I took some beautiful photos of some cream uh, wild indigo. Uh, lots and lots of, of native plants are starting to, to um, show themselves amongst the um, things that are a little bit more prolific, uh, like butterweed and uh, some of the clover species, but cool place. And uh, yes, butterweed definitely is here to stay. Now, um, since we're on kind of an invasive species role, I noticed this the other day. It was uh, talking to our custodian about a couple of park district matters. And uh, this is the burr oak tree right here in front of Good Natured World Headquarters. Look who's out for a stroll today. Um, this is a young gypsy moth caterpillar. So I thought I'd done a pretty good job of scraping the egg masses off of the tree, but I clearly didn't get them all. Um, now we can tell this is a gypsy moth as we watch it move. You can see it's got the red raised dots towards the back of its body, and it's got blue raised dots towards the front of its body. It's got hair. Those hairs will continue to grow. Um, I thought it might be good to do a little investigating to see is there any anything that's going to come in and help control these forests, or is it strictly up to us? Um, just a little bit of a review. They did come to this country intentionally. They were brought here um, as an, a part of an investigation to see if they might be good for producing uh, silk stateside. Uh, didn't work in um, ruh -roh, uh, They got out, they started to spread. Um, we talked about those Eastern forests. They had plenty to eat out there. And um, uh, because they're uh, able to move fairly easily. Uh, the females don't fly, but the males do. Um, they were able to uh, somewhat steadily over the next hundred years or so march their way west. Um, so they produce uh, up to 500 eggs per egg case. And um, I thought this was kind of interesting. They do have both mammal and uh, insect predators. White-footed mice will uh, feed on um, gypsy moth uh, egg cases and the, actually the female moths themselves. But um, the predation by mice, it's not a, it's, they don't like build their life cycle around gypsy moths. They're primarily seed eaters. If we have a big mast crop, if we have a lot of acorns or uh, other tree nuts, then we, next year we get a lot of mice. Then we might see the mice, uh, as the population increases, there might be some control that is applied to gypsy moths if we've got a lot of mice, but it's not like the mice go running around looking specifically for the gypsy moths. Uh, Short-tailed shrews have been known to prey on them as well. Um, and then they've got some in, uh, invertebrate um, predators, primarily ants and ground beetles. So there is some control. Um, there's other things that can be done too. Uh, BT, Bacillus uh, thuringius this, this, uh, is a bacteria that can be sprayed. You might remember several years ago, there were helicopters that were going uh, and dropping that um, uh, bacteria, which does, it is lethal to the gypsy moth caterpillar. It's also lethal to other caterpillars. It's, it, it, it affects um, developing lepidopterans at a specific stage in their life. So any lepidopteran, so any butterfly, any moth that's in that particular stage at the time that that um, bacteria is applied is going to die from it. So um, I've talked to our arborist uh, about the gypsy moths on this tree. He says it's not really something he's too worried about. Um, I did notice that as I was, um, 
talking to our custodian that I was getting little black dots on me. I was getting pooped on by gypsy moth caterpillars. So there are a few up there. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on it and um, I'll report back if there's anything significant that develops there. Now, uh, I mentioned ground beetles um, as a predator of gypsy moths. These guys are out and about these days. I saw this one the other day um, over on a bike trail, one of the bike trails over at uh, Leroy Oaks. I'll turn this down. Um, see how they move like this? They um, are, uh, well, this one was probably uh, kind of irritated that it was being followed, but they they can move quite quickly. These are very, very good predators. We, we had talked before, uh, was it two weeks ago, we talked about tiger beetles, uh, another predatory beetle and how they fly. They move very quickly, but they fly. Ground beetles don't tend to uh, fly. They tend to run. They do have wings as adults, but they're uh, not inclined to use them. Now, I was going to see if I could try and identify this, and boy, within about two clicks of bug guide, I realized I was way over my head. There's um, close to, to 2,500 species uh, of ground beetles in the United States. Uh, look at the, the uh, mandibles on the front of this beetle, though. Um, this is a true, uh, true sign of a uh, hardy predator of other invertebrates. Um, I thought it was interesting that, that for the most part, these guys are predators and they'll just eat whatever they can overpower and squeeze in those jaws. But many ground beetles will also feed on seeds. And I don't know if maybe that's, uh, we're not quite into our, our uh, seed portion of our plant life cycles, but I wanna pay more attention to these guys as we get into fall to see if I can find any that aren't uh, hunting insects, but rather are hunting uh, seeds. Might be kind of cool to see. But anyway, ground beetles, uh, very active right now, something to look out for, and they are um, very helpful things to have around. So speaking of beetles, this will give you a, a little glimpse into life at Casa Otto. I was um, actually going down the hallway to get ready for bed the other night, and I saw this little creature um, on the floor. I apologize for the poor camera work, but um, I was a little sleepy, but it might be something that you'll want to try yourself if you're lucky enough to have one of these show up. Let me see if I can get the video started here. So um, this is a click beetle. Do you see what it just did? Let's see if it goes again. Oh, check that out. Oh, there's tech support puppy. Um, yeah, um, let's watch it one more time because it, they move really fast. I remember playing with these as a kid. There's there's all different kinds of click beetles, eh, as there are, uh, there's, there's just all kinds of them. Um, I don't know what kind this was, but they have a mechanism. Oh, there he goes. Eh, I didn't want tech support puppy to, to eat the little click beetle. I actually ended up putting him out on the deck, but um, they flip their bodies. Um, as a means of defense. If they should find themselves on their backs, their, their bellies are what is vulnerable. They've got the hard shell across the back, so they're somewhat protected. But if they uh, somehow get upended, um, they have this mechanism inside. There's a, a, a latch um, that hooks, uh, it's kind of like a hinge that, that hooks closed. And is, that's its normal state but there's tension there. And should the beetle find itself on its back, it can uh, flip over and it flips itself uh, 20 body lengths into the air. Um, and this happens a hundred times faster than the blink of an eye. So I thought those are some pretty amazing statistics. Um, I also stumbled on an article, um, there's, Turns out there's some research very recently uh, completed or reported on, it was in January of this year, uh, some um, engineers were studying the motion of how this click beetle makes its jump. They actually uh, used some of the equipment up at Argonne uh, National Labs to uh, film the mechanism inside of the beetle's thorax that allows it to make this flip. And uh, they're hoping that they can um, apply this now to um, some of the other um, projects that they're working on, but it's this elastic motion 
that makes click beetles click. Um, if you want to check out this article, take note of um, that title, or uh, you can Google uh, University of Illinois uh, click beetles, and it'll probably come up in your search engine. There's a neat link in the article that takes you to a YouTube video that shows um, what these researchers were able to discover and talks a little bit more about how they're going to apply that to other projects they're working on. Um, I believe some of it has already been put into play with some of the robot technology that's out there when robots tip over, um, which they do, this uh, uh, click beetle um, mechanism is uh, being looked at as, as a means of helping get robots righted again. So um, that brings us to the end of uh, this week's hour. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about spittle bugs. Um, actually saw some of those again today. Uh, really neat um, little insect inside of there that uh, grows up into an equally neat insect uh, called a frog hopper. Um, skiff moth caterpillars are a thing. Uh, they don't look at all like caterpillars. I was reminded of them the other day and I've got some neat photos. Um, of a skiff moth caterpillar that we found on uh, an oak tree. I've um, been seeing uh, a lot of kingbirds and I've been hearing some Phoebes and I thought it might be fun. Uh, I'm not very good with identifying uh, the different types of birds that are fly catchers, but these are two that um, I feel pretty confident with and um, maybe, maybe you already do. And if you don't, maybe uh, after next week's segments, you will uh, feel confident in identifying them. Um, Thanks to uh, reader and listener Kim, we're going to take a look at Great Angelica versus Cow Parsnip. Um, actually, Kim is able to point out some neat ways to tell those two plants apart. Uh, who knows what else is going to happen in the next week. So um, I appreciate you uh, sticking with me through that tech outage there. And um, I promise, well, no, I won't promise it won't happen again, but I'll try and figure out what happened to make sure um, we can try to prevent it from happening again. I'm going to go over here because we've got some uh, chats here. I wonder how many of these um, are going to say, hey, Pam, we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, let's take a look here. Um, OK. Barred owls. Um, yes, the barred owl is larger than the spotted owl. Um, should we be pulling Dame's rocket? Um, you know, this whole pulling thing, you know, there's been some um, new opinions on what we should be doing, even with garlic mustard. There's a lot, like I know our restoration team still pulls garlic mustard. Some um, people are now saying if you just leave it in place, it will run its course over time. I personally would pull it. I know um, I was with our restoration ecologist yesterday, uh, Ryan Solomon, and he had two big handfuls of it. So yeah, if you want to control it, um, you've got more than usual this year, Meg. It seems like it's just having a really good year. And if you don't want it to spread, control um, pulling it by, um, controlling it by pulling it, um, seems like it's a good thing to do. Um, Justin, um, yeah, we have tons of garlic mustard. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of those plants, it, it has a lot of advantages. It makes a lot of seeds. And when you make a lot of seeds, you're going to get a lot of new plants. It does take two years for the garlic mustard to um, um, mature. I haven't, um, I can't say for sure if that's the case with Dame's Rocket, but it might be. Uh, in which case this would be the second year of a two year cycle. I'll have to double check on that, but, um, and uh, yeah, Justin said, if, if you uh, pull garlic mustard, if you pull it at the right time when, you, when it's still uh, somewhat fresh uh, or new to the ground, the growth is still young, it does make a really good pesto. Uh, I've sampled it and it is uh, tasty. It was brought to this country as a food plant. So it does have some redeeming qualities. Uh, you know, I remember um, back in my, uh, when we first moved into the house here in St. Charles, I was uh, over 25 years ago and I was looking at different plants. And I remembered whenever I would see a description that said it was a vigorous grower, I thought, oh, that's good because I need something. I'm not a gardener, but I need something vigorous. Turns out vigorous more often than not also means um, invasive. So uh, keep that in mind as you make your plant choices, if you're making plant choices this springtime. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Anything uh, else for the good of the group? 
Um, if not, I uh, hope we see y'all back next week. Have lots more things uh, planned. Things that are unplanned too. You never know what's going to happen as we have this wonderful world of nature around us. So have a great rest of your night, everybody. Um, hope to see you again back next week. Take care. Thanks, Pam. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks. Sorry about the tech Thanks. stuff. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Try and figure that out. <laughs> see ya. <laughs>